This presentation is called Using DNA to Identify Soldiers of the Western Front. And it's a presentation I gave at the annual conference of the British Isles Family History Society of Greater Ottawa in September 2016. Now, the Western Front stretched from Belgium in the north down to Switzerland in the south, and many of the battles of World War I were fought on the Western Front, including the Battle of the Somme, which uh, we commemorate this year, it being the centenary of that particular battle. Uh, you can see that the British Army was stationed and headquartered in the northern part of the front. Uh, the French Army had headquarters along the front. The US Army uh, also had headquarters um, near the River Marne. And the Imperial German Army had headquarters in both Belgium and in northern France. So uh, many of the men who fought on the Western Front died along this particular line. And this particular map is taken from uh, Trench Warfare on the Western Front uh, website, and you can see the link to it down there. All in all, about one million men were killed and 800 men, 800 women uh, during World War I. And of these, 338,955 are still missing and unaccounted for, still lying there on the Western Front. And these figures are taken from uh, this website, longtrail.co.uk, longlongtrail.co.uk, and the actual figure is there, uh, those that are not buried at all, 338,955. So approximately 30 bodies are found every year on the Western Front, and it would take over a thousand years to recover all 338,000 of these men and women who have not yet been found. But remains are found every year. About 30 to 60 soldiers are recovered. Uh, so, for example, in April of this year, 19 soldiers were recovered, of whom two were German, Nine were Commonwealth, possibly Canadian, and two of these soldiers have been identified so far. And that badge you see there is of the Royal Warwickshire Regiment. There's also a map on uh, Google Maps uh, which pinpoints where the remains of World War I servicemen have been found on the Western Front. And uh, you can see that there are some Canadian soldiers that have been found there as well. Uh, this particular one in Hallow in France um, identified three unknown Canadians killed between the 8th and 11th of September 1918, and they were found in April 2007. So what is the process for managing the recovered remains? And I have a little bit of a question mark here because there is no real um, clear-cut information on any of the official websites. So I've had to gather this from uh, the various forums, uh, the Great War Forum, etc., on the internet. And it seems that when remains are found due to uh, routine farming work or um, road widening schemes, the local police will first of all be informed uh, because they'll need to determine whether this is a recent death or a recent murder and therefore requires a criminal investigation or whether they are war remains and in which case the recovery will be handed over uh, usually to the Commonwealth War Grave Commission if it is in France, but in Belgium uh, the recovery is usually undertaken by the police. But at times the local army has been involved, archaeologists have been involved, or even the original finder has been involved if they have the professional acumen to do so. The Commonwealth War Graves Commission stores the remains in their mortuary and also secures the artefacts that are found along with the bodies. If the nationality can be identified, then the Commonwealth War Graves Commission reports this find to the member government Ministry of Defence. So in uh, UK, that'll be the JCCC, and in the uh, Germany, it'll be the VDK. Now, the JCCC coordinates the efforts to identify the soldier, and that includes the nationality, the regiment, and the individual. And if the individual can be identified, then the family are traced and a funeral is organised. 
This is coordinated by the Ministry of Defence in the UK. Uh, the subgroup beneath that is the Service Personnel and Veterans Agency and the JCCC itself stands for the Joint Casualty and Compassionate Centre. And there's a sub-team of that called the Historic Casualty and Deceased Estates Casework Team. And there are two people on that particular team who deal with historic casualties and war dead. So all of this work that is being done to identify the 30 servicemen that are found each year is done by a two-person team. So you can imagine that there is certainly a capacity to become work overloaded. The recovery team itself might include a forensic archaeologist uh, employing uh, crime scene investigation-like recovery uh, procedures, uh, perhaps a forensic anthropologist as well, who will measure things like uh, the height of the individual, any battle wounds that are uh, obvious on the body, uh, and any distinguishing features. Other uh, military personnel that might be involved include a military historian, a photographer, and maybe a project manager if it is a large enough find. Um, and the, the main thrust of their work will be to try to establish the nationality of the individual, what regiment they belonged to, and preferably if we can actually name the individual soldier involved. Artifacts that may be found at the scene might be very, very large. For example, here's a tank. Um, here is ammunition uh, that has been found beside the bodies. Uh, trench digging tools can also tell you whether the soldier is a German or British or French. Um, various pieces of clothing, such as these boots. Uh, buttons and also insignias are also very, very useful for identifying nationality and regiment. And this, uh, like I say, is the Royal Warwickshire uh, badge. Dog tags were introduced in August 1914, um, but they were only single dog tags. Uh, the double dog tag system was only introduced in September of 1916. And even though, um, and, and Fromel happened in July of 1916, so there was uh, only single dog tags being worn by the soldiers at, at Fromel at that time. These are some examples of some of the artifacts that might be found with bodies. We can see things here like um, a pipe, uh, buckles associated with belts, um, here's some ammunition, some glass bottles, a tin box, a spent casing, a, a spoon, um, and a helmet, and a shoe brush perhaps here, and sometimes books and paper artifacts as well. The process for identifying the remains involves an initial identification of nationality and regiment, and in this regard, historical war records are very, very useful because they will uh, tell us the troop movements that occurred in particular areas. Also, artifacts found with or near the remains can be very useful for identifying the nationality or regiment. Um, if possible, the individual should be identified. Now, routinely, DNA has not been taken. DNA samples have not been taken, but apparently, according to one of the posts on uh, one of the World War I forums, uh, DNA is now being routinely as of April of 2016, but that needs to be confirmed. Genealogy and potential living relatives are uh, traced or attempted to be traced, and that means working with volunteer genealogists. And these are people who have traditionally give their time for free, and without these volunteer genealogists, the tracing of living relatives would be impossible. If relatives are contacted, um, then DNA is, is taken from the relatives. They're asked to give DNA, and most of the time they consent. And this helps to confirm the identity of the individual involved. And we'll talk a little bit about that in due course. There's a problem, of course, with the British records, and that is that many of them were destroyed during World War II. 
only about seventy percent, only about thirty percent of the records survived. Seventy percent of them were destroyed. Um, in contrast, the Canadian and Australian service files still exist and are uh, very comprehensive in the information that they contain. But despite these drawbacks, most servicemen's whereabouts can be located given a name, a regiment, and a date. There are certain issues and concerns that, that have been expressed on the discussion forums about the Great War, and uh, it's difficult to know whether some of these are still relevant. But uh, previously, there has been concern that insufficient efforts have been made to identify found remains. And this is partly because, um, as far as the recovery of remains is concerned, a lot of the time farmers do not report them because it creates too much delay. It's an inconvenience for their work day and uh, they may suffer a loss of income if the particular area of the field where the find is discovered is cordoned off and is not accessible for maybe up to a year. So there is um, an incentive for the farmers to just plough the remains over or bulldoze them over and not report them at all. Another problem is that the local laws and customs are not clearly stated, and even if they are clearly stated, are they well understood by the locals? Um, another consideration is that should local laws exist, are they actually observed um, or are they enforced at all? So there's a lot of confusion and uh, uncertainty about the state of local laws and how effectively they, they are enforced. There's also a big problem with trophy hunters, and a lot of the time uh, these people will make the recovery of found remains difficult. Um, another big problem previously was incentives to report found remains can be potentially detrimental. So, for example, in the 1920s, when a monetary reward was offered for people who found the remains of soldiers on the Western Front, um, some people finding these remains would actually split the remains in two and claim it was two bodies rather than one and therefore double the amount of money they get uh, from the uh, funding bodies. Lack of transparency as to the exact process is still a problem because there isn't um, any information on the uh, government websites telling us exactly what the exact process uh, is. And a problem up until maybe April of this year is that DNA has not routinely been recovered from the remains prior to reburial, and therefore those that have been buried so far without any DNA being taken, there is going to be no way of identifying them. And that brings us on to the Fromel project, and this is the uh, web page from the Ministry of Defence in Australia website, uh, which talks about the particular project. You see the link there at the bottom. And most of the information that I've got uh, for this inf uh, presentation on Fromel uh, comes from these books, Remembering Fromel, uh, compiled by Judy Summers, and Remember Me to All, published by Oxford Archaeology and uh, contributed to by Louise Lowe, Caroline Baker, Kate Brady, Margaret Cox and Helen Webb. And these are both available from Amazon and you can see the links there at the bottom. There's also a very useful documentary on Fromel which was made by Channel 4 in the United Kingdom and this can be viewed free online if you simply Google Finding the Lost Battalions or you can click on that link there at the bottom of your screen. So the Battle of Fromel occurred on the 19th of July 1916 and it was a diversionary tactic. It was uh, undertaken in conjunction with the Battle of the Somme and the idea was to distract the Germans from uh, the fact that the Battle of the Somme was ongoing and to stop them sending reinforcements. So that's why Fromel uh, occurred and this was the third time they had a battle in this area and it was the third time that it went horribly wrong. 5,533 Australian casualties occurred on um, during the battle and the first 24 hours of the battle were uh, are frequently described as the worst day in Australian military history. 
2,000 people were killed, over 1,300 were missing, um, and of the British casualties, uh, about 1,547 casualties with 500 dead. So altogether, roughly about 1,700, 1,800 people were killed at the Battle of Fromel. Now, in terms of counting the dead and where they actually are, most of them are buried in VC Corner Cemetery. And the memorial there lists 1,294 Australian soldiers missing, presumed dead. Uh, this was 1,299, but five were subsequently identified in the 1920s. And it also records 410 unidentified Australian soldiers buried there. Other nearby cemeteries, uh, such as Rue David, has 266, Ration Farm 142, Rue Petillon 22, and Y Farm 72. Uh, and that means that there were 1,131 unknown Australian burials in total, uh, meaning that 163 Australian soldiers are still missing. And this was a question that struck a researcher, Lambis Englezos, who was a former school teacher from Melbourne, who developed a very, very keen interest in the Battle of Fromel. And he started investigating where these missing, these 163 missing Australian soldiers could possibly be. In 2003, a military historian Peter Barton became involved. He is the co-secretary of the All Party War Graves and Battle Heritage Group in the UK. And in 2006, they found documentary records which indicated that mass graves had been dug for 400 dead behind Pheasant Wood near Fromel. And this raised the, po the possibility that if there were 400 buried in these graves, then possibly 160 would be Australian and 240 could be British. And that's why the British government became particularly interested at this point in time. And so a limited geophysical survey was uh, contracted and it confirmed that eight mass graves were present. And then in 2008, a limited excavation uh, occurred and this confirmed that remains were present in these mass graves. And you can read uh, all about the discovery of these mass graves in issue 44 of Wartime, and the links to that particular uh, copy of the magazine are there, and that is freely available online. And here is an aerial photograph of Fromel and the particular part of uh, Pheasant Wood where these mass graves were found, and they set up a temporary uh, mortuary and scientific uh, lab in this area. And that was uh, resulted in the excavation and exhumation of these soldiers, 250 soldiers, between the 5th of May 2009 and the 16th of October 2009. Criminal scene investigation or crime scene investigation uh, like procedures were employed to avoid contamination. Uh, all artifacts associated and found with the bodies were logged and a chain of custody was established. Here are some of the artifacts that were found. This is a, a Bible, a page from a Bible. This is a boot. This is a leather pouch with a solid gold cross. This is either a compass or a pocket watch. There is an engraving on the back, but no identifying uh, text. This is somebody's cardigan. This is a pair of rosary beads. This is a leather coin pouch and some coins associated with it. Many of the soldiers smoked and here is a selection of matches. And this is a leather pouch uh, for containing wire cutters. This rather poignant one is the return segment of a return ticket to Perth, Australia, 
obviously it was never used. So altogether 250 remains were exhumed from the site and DNA collection involved first of all taking DNA samples from the people that were doing the excavation uh, in order to form an elimination database. Samples from the people working with the remains were collected. The collection was supervised by the Commonwealth War, War Grave Commission project manager and the samples were stored by the scene of crime officer, the SOCO. Also DNA samples were collected from the bodies of the scene, so supervised by the SOCO. They were transported to LGC Forensics Laboratories in London and the viability of DNA extraction was determined. The type of DNA samples that were collected were a minimum of one tooth and one bone sample. The tooth could be an upper, upper canine or an upper second molar, preferably. Uh, bone uh, was preferably metacarpals, which are the bones in the feet, or sorry, metacarpals are the bones in the hand, metatarsals are the bones in the feet, the fibula is the uh, bone on the outside of the shin, um, the lower leg, uh, long bones such as the humerus and the radius in the arm or the um, uh, femur in the leg and ulna or rib were also used. Sometimes a soft tissue was collected such as hair, Achilles tendon or even brain tissue and the results of the viability examination by LGC Forensics showed that DNA was recoverable but it was present in low quantities and in a degraded form. Nevertheless, sufficiently usable DNA survived to obtain Y, STR and mtDNA, mitochondrial DNA profiles for all the buried soldiers. <clears throat> a comparative database was then put together because we have approximately 1,650 named soldiers who were classified as missing. We had 250 of these recovered and these 250 recovered soldiers were among this list of 1,650. So we needed to get DNA samples from each of the families of the 250 soldiers. But in order to do that, we had to trace the families of all 1,650 soldiers that were missing. We had to identify informative DNA donors in each family, meaning donors that give, give us either Y DNA or mitochondrial DNA. And preferably we wanted two samples of Y DNA from different people in the family and two samples of mitochondrial DNA from different people in the family, meaning that we needed 6,600 donors in order to identify 250 soldiers. So you can see what an incredible undertaking this particular project was. Here's an example of informative DNA donors. If we assume that this is the soldier who's been recovered, born about 1895, then if he had brothers who had sons, who had sons, the Y DNA would have been passed on from their father to each of the sons and then onto their sons and then onto their sons. Uh, this particular person here would be a brother of the individual. This would be a nephew of the individual and this person down here would be a grand nephew of the individual. Um, for mitochondrial DNA, we'd look to sisters of the soldier and their daughters and their daughters or sons. Um, as long as these the men were living, they would have the mitochondrial DNA inherited from their mothers, but they would not have been able to pass it on to their children. So the males are the end of the line, the the females are not the end of the line, but this is the line of the, the, the pathway of mitochondrial DNA and these people would be informative mitochondrial DNA do donors and these would be grand nieces and grand nephews of the individual related to the individual by a direct female line going all the way back to the soldier's mother. Now a lot of the time there aren't these direct male or direct female lines on either side of the family tree and in that case it may be necessary to go back an extra generation 
And in this situation, then, you're looking at going back to the soldier's father and uh, looking at a brother of the father and then looking at the brother's direct male line descendants for informative Y DNA donors. And you might even have to go back up another generation uh, to uh, the mother's mother's sister and then a direct female line down and these would be the second cousins twice removed of the soldier. So those would be informative DNA uh, donors and you can see that this requires a lot of genealogical work. So the volunteer genealogists who did this work both in the UK and in Australia spent a huge amount of time trying to trace living relatives and if it was not for the work that these volunteer genealogists did then the whole project would have been a failure. Tracing living relatives was undertaken by the JCCC in the UK and the UWCA in Australia, the Unrecovered War Casualties uh, Army in Australia. There were two methods. The first method was a publicity method where a petition for family to come forward was sent out. Very successful in Australia because Fromel was very well known. However, it's not a battle that is well known in the UK. However, local media reports on individual soldiers were very successful in bringing families forward and road shows in specific regions of the UK were also useful for identifying uh, living relatives of, this, of soldiers among the 1,650 missing. The second method of tracing living relatives was a hands-on tracing method and that was where these volunteer gene genealogists tracked down soldiers from the list of 1,650. Uh, regimental groups and various societies were also very helpful in this regard. Uh, Mel Pack traced most of the British families with the assistance of Michelle Leonard and a variety of other uh, genealogists, volunteer genealogists in the UK. No possible genetic identification um, occurred in only a very small number of cases. So um, in most cases, it was possible to trace living relatives. But in a small number of cases, either the family was extinct or there was no informative relatives uh, surviving um, or there wasn't a direct male line or direct female line. And in rare cases, the family was unwilling to donate DNA. And this only happened in three out of 277 families in the UK. Only Y DNA or mitochondrial DNA was collected uh, initially. Uh, there was no autosomal DNA connect collected, apparently. But I do need to check that fact because I'm not entirely sure. I do think that in some cases, autosomal DNA was retrieved from some of the soldiers' remains. Um, in terms of the family, uh, some family DNA was recovered from deceased people via medical slides or biopsies. So um, for the families at least, they didn't collect autosomal DNA as far as I'm aware, but they did collect, collect Y DNA and mitochondrial DNA, and uh, in some cases used medical slides or biopsies to extract DNA from informative relatives. A non-paternity event rate of about 1 to 2% was uh, predicted, and in fact 2% was the rate observed. And by non-paternity event, we're talking about things like a secret adoption or an illegitimacy um, uh, that well, the family was not aware of. And that, of course, would uh, disturb the line of continuity in terms of either Y DNA or mitochondrial DNA. The identification process itself involved a data analysis team chaired by Professor Margaret Cox of Oxford Archaeology. Uh, the co-chair was uh, Peter Jones, a geneticist, and a variety of subject matter experts were co-opted onto the analysis team as needed. And these included experts in anthropology, archaeology, molecular genetics, military history, uh, records and statistics. Following the review by the data analysis team, recommendations were made to the Joint Investigation, Joint Identification Board. And the JIB decided whether or not to accept the uh, recommendations 
of the data analysis team or not. Uh, if they did accept the recommendations for identification by the data analysis team, then the Commonwealth War Grave Commission was informed. They checked against their database that the soldier identified had not already been buried in a grave. And in fact, in one case, uh, there was an instance where a soldier had previously been um, buried uh, in a grave, but the earlier assignment of his identity was judged to be based on scant evidence and the, the um, identification, the previous identification was reversed and a new identification was given to the body found at Fromel. The soldier's identification or identity is then passed to the relevant government minister who notifies the family and once the family have been notified then the media is informed. And updates on the identification process were published on a relatively regular basis on the Commonwealth War Graves Commission website and you can see the particular page there. This one is from February 2012 when the third annual Joint Identification Board convened. And the identification standards were, in order to identify which army the soldier belonged to, the identification standard was the balance of probabilities. But in order to identify the individual, a different standard was used. And this was clear and convincing evidence that indicates that an identification is substantially more likely than not. And that was the standard used for identifying individual people. So this raises the question, how often did non-DNA evidence lead to identification of a soldier? And the answer is absolutely none whatsoever, in no case at all. Because the first data analysis team met in 2010 when there was no DNA available at that point in time. And only three soldiers out of the 250 were tentatively identified from non-DNA evidence, for example, inscribed artifacts, and no positive identifications were assigned at the first data analysis team meet meeting. And one of the main reasons for this was that only one dog tag was worn by soldiers at Fromel. The two dog tag system had not been introduced at that point in time. And of course, all personal items and identification tags were removed by the Germans and sent to the Red Cross. So that left little evidence on the body to identify which soldier this was. So the process of recovering personal remains to be sent back home to the families of the dead meant that the remains that were found at Fromel had little evidence to identify the soldier. DNA matching fell largely into two groups. Group one was where the DNA matched a donor's family uh, with a strong match probability. Also, the DNA profile was not present in a, the elimination database, and there was no evidence of a non-paternity event, an adoption or an illegitimacy. Group two is when the DNA profile did not match any of the current donor families, the DNA matched possibly several donor families as another alternative uh, due to partial profiles or common Y or mitochondrial DNA profiles or even contradictory profiles suggesting that a non-paternity event uh, had occurred within the family, an adoption or an illegitimacy. Um, alternatively, DNA only matched a particular haplogroup and there wasn't any further information uh, other than that or where there was a suspicion of a non-paternity event somewhere within that particular family. So those were the two groups. One, where there was a strong match with between the soldier's DNA and the donor family, and the group two, where this uh, strong match was not present at all, and several different possibilities uh, could have existed. In terms of match probabilities, how many YSTOR markers were recovered? Probably about 17. Uh, LGC Forensics used the Y Filer uh, 17 marker test for amplifying the DNA, and uh, this would only have included 17 STR markers on the Y chromosome. 
it is not clear how many mitochondrial DNA markers were recovered because this is not actually reported in either of the books and I cannot find it um, online. The strongest match probabilities were one out of 1,915 for mitochondrial DNA and one out of 3,387 for Y DNA. In other words, the uh, probability of a match occurring by chance was one in 1,915 for the mitochondrial DNA um, uh, profiles and uh, occurring by chance in one out of 3,000 uh, cases for Y DNA. Uh, these are not great probabilities in themselves, but if you have Y DNA and mitochondrial DNA from the same individual, then you can multiply them together to give you a cumulative probability. Um, and if we use those uh, best case scenarios, that gives a probability of the match occurring by chance to be somewhere in the region of 1 uh, in 6.4 million. So it was the multiplication of the Y DNA probability with the mitochondrial DNA probability that gave the strongest indication of a definite identification. Bayesian probability statistics were used in this process and John Reed has reviewed the same process uh, that was used to identify the skeleton of Richard III um, and John gave a very useful YouTube presentation on that at Who Do You Think You Are in April of 2016 and you can view it online on that link at the bottom of the screen. Another thing that was useful in the identification process was the use of haplogroup assignments. Now a haplogroup is in broad terms a group of people who sh largely share the same genetic signature. So for example people in Western Europe will largely be, or a lot of them will be, haplogroup R, and in China it'll be haplogroup O, and in South America it'll be haplogroup Q. So if you come back with a haplogroup Q, then your direct male line ancestry is probably from South America. If it's O, it's probably from China. If it's R, it's probably from Western Europe. Uh, so it's a very crude way of telling you where in the world a particular person might have come from. But it was useful uh, in some of the cases uh, in Fromel. So for example, uh, some haplogroups indicate potential Jewish ancestry and of course uh, Jewish religion was noted on enlistment records for uh, the soldiers. Also some haplogroup assignments suggested Aboriginal ancestry and in fact some soldiers were noted as dark or darky or half caste on their uh, records, terms that would not be used today. Um, Eastern European haplogroups uh, were frequently matched up with Eastern European surnames and in some cases Scandinavian haplogroups helped match people with potential Scandinavian surnames. So this was not a, a reliable record, a reliable method for uh, definite identification and it was not used for assigning identification but it was used for merely supporting identification and helping to point people in the right direction. So on the 19th of July 2010 the last burial in the newly created Pheasant Wood Cemetery took place and as of September 2016 150 of the 250 soldiers who have been buried there have been identified and largely through the use of DNA. Uh, a very useful video on the science behind the story at Fromel uh, made by LGC Forensics is available on YouTube and that's the link there. One of the quotes from Remember Me to All which struck me was this one here. In order to establish a familial link, it is essential to locate a living genetic relative from, if possible, both their maternal and paternal lines. Without living relatives, it is extremely difficult to match the DNA of a buried soldier to that of the family of a missing soldier, as the buried soldier's DNA profile without an external reference is simply an anonymous signature. End quote. Well, that was true 
before we had an external reference become available. And there is an external reference available now. Um, and it is the publicly available database of Family Tree DNA, uh, also publicly available database of Ysearch. And here, for example, is a Family Tree DNA. And if you put <clears throat> soldier uh, number 123 into their database, um, you find in this situation that at 12 markers, there are eight matches and these surnames include Massey, Massey, Simmons, Massey, Simmons, Massey, Simmons, Massey. If we increase the resolution level to 25 DNA markers, and these are STR markers, you can see that there is Massey, Massey, Simmons, 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 Massey, and no. And at 37 markers, there's three matches, Massey, Simmons, and Simmons. So in this particular instance, the most likely candidate for the soldier would be somebody called Simmons or Massey. Another example, here's soldier 456. He does the 37 marker test, 37 STR marker, and he has got five matches at this level in the Family Tree DNA database. Denman, 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 Denman. Well, it's pretty clear that the most likely candidate for the soldier would be somebody called Denman. Another example then is this individual here, soldier 789. And at the 37 marker levels, he has seven matches, McLaughlin, McMahon, Gleason, Neville, Sykes, Hart, and Markham. If we increase the resolution to 67 markers, he's got three matches, Gleason, Gleason, and McLaughlin. And if we increase it to 111 markers, he's got two matches, somebody called Little, and then a Gleason. But if you look at the Little, they've said that the most distant known ancestor is an unidentified Gleason. So in this particular situation, the most likely surname candidate for the soldier would be Gleason. But we've had to go up to 111 markers to achieve this. Now, that's on the Family Tree DNA database. There's also Ysearch, which is a free uh, public database. Anybody can use this. Um, you click on this particular uh, link here, and it brings you to a, a page where you can manually insert the values for each of the STR markers, up to 100 STR markers. And this is done completely privately, completely anonymously. Uh, you don't have to give any name, and nobody can trace the identity of the individual by using this method. So for example, I took the first 19 markers from uh, Gleason Lineage 1. Uh, the Gleason DNA project is one of the projects that I'm a co-administrator of. And um, Gleason Lineage 1 is the first group within the project. So I entered 19 markers into this Ysearch database. And the results show that I had nine matches to Gleason. And there's Gleason uh, down there, as you can see. And in the first 1,000 matches, there were nine Gleasons present, which is a signal of about 0.9%. But if I restricted it just to the exact matches, Gleason occurred in 23% of the exact matches. So there was a very, very strong signal in this instance that um, 19 STR markers were sufficient to identify a strong signal for the surname candidate. The Ysearch database, how big is it? Well, it has 177,000 records uh, in the Ysearch database and a surname count of 110,000. The Family Tree DNA database currently has 579,000 Y-DNA records and is the largest database of its kind in the world. Um, so for future considerations, if an unknown soldier is found, and if the regiment is identified by artifactual evidence at the scene, then all families of the regiment's missing soldiers would need to be traced and their DNA tested, and that would be very, very costly. Now, that is the old method. With the new method, we can now narrow it down via the assessment for surname candidates. And that means extracting DNA from the remains of the soldier 
and then entering it into one of the public databases like Ysearch or Family Tree DNA, which can be arranged privately with the CEO, Bennett Greenspan, and then seeing if any surname candidates come up among the matches of that soldier. And this would substantially reduce the cost of trying to trace all the families of all the missing soldiers in that particular regiment, DNA testing all of the families in order to identify this one individual. So, what is the likelihood that this is happening? Well, the likelihood of your relative being found is somewhere in the region of 30 out of 338,000. So there's 30 bodies discovered every year, there's 338,000 still lying somewhere on the Western Front, and that gives a likelihood ratio of 1 in 100,000 per year, or 1 in 10,000 over the course of the next 10 years, or 1 in 1,000 over the course of the next 100 years. But in 100 years' time, will the remains have decayed to such an extent that identification via DNA will no longer be viable? That's a big question. The likelihood of being identified, well, using this surname technique of trying to assess um, the matches of a given DNA profile for particular surname candidates, this occurs, in my experience, in about 10 to 15 percent of cases. So that would mean that the likelihood of uh, remains being identified is about one in a million per year or one in a hundred thousand over ten years. So the likelihood that your relative, your missing relative, will be identified is actually very, very slim indeed. But even one identification is worthwhile. And that's why uh, I think it is worthwhile to promote this particular new method to um, forensic laboratories uh, all over the world, not just uh, in the UK, but uh, anywhere where identification of human remains is um, part of their day-to-day -day work. What can you do to help this process? Well, I think documenting the genealogy of your fallen relative is very, very important. And particularly in this four-year period where we are commemorating World War I, between 1914 and 1918, uh, it is important to do the genealogy of these fallen soldiers and to publicize them as well. So if you can identify and anonymize potential living descendants for DNA testing, Y-DNA, mitochondrial DNA and autosomal DNA, and then put this genealogy online uh, with the sources that you have used so that anybody that comes along afterwards to verify your work can do so easily. Uh, I think that's a very important process. We can also leave a digital DNA memorial for the fallen soldier, including a link to the traditional genealogy in the family tree on Ancestry or MyHeritage or Genes Reunited or any of these online websites. We can also include any DNA data if it is available and also include contact details so that you can be contacted should anybody uh, in the Ministry of Defence ever decide to get in touch with you. And the Digital DNA Memorial can be left on a variety of websites. One of them is Lives of the First World War, and this can be done uh, completely free of charge. Uh, another website is Every Man Remembered, and this deals specifically with men who have died, the one million service men and women who lost their lives during the First World War. And I've left a memorial for one of my relatives. Um, I think he was my second cousin twice removed. And his name was Private Michael Spiron of the Royal Dublin Fusiliers. And he died on the 7th of May 1916 at the young age of 19. Now he is identified and he is buried in Bethune Town Cemetery in the Pas de Calais. I've put a little memorial for him and that includes a story which uh, says that Michael Spiron was my second cousin twice removed, one of about 10 children. He was the son of Michael Edward Spiron and Mary Cummins, who moved from Dublin to Birkenhead sometime after 1911. The Spiron family go back to Limerick in the late 1600s, and the family tree is online, and I give the online link in that following piece of text. 
Michael died of wounds sustained by artillery fire in May 1916 and is buried in Bethune Town Cemetery, plot VC 22. But I've also left this. Various relatives of Michael Spearn have undergone DNA testing. Michael's DNA is shared by the following people. Y DNA, kit AQHYD on Y search and 209715 on FTDNA, family tree DNA, from his second cousin once removed. No mitochondrial DNA at present, and autosomal DNA represented by kit 221175 on family tree DNA, which is his paternal first cousin. And then my uh, contact details are included at the bottom. This is the home page of Family Tree DNA, your Y DNA matches, and you can see down here at the bottom there is a facility to upload the results to Y Search. So I encourage everybody to upload your results to Y Search. The more results that are uploaded, the stronger the database becomes and the more useful it becomes for identifying human remains. There's a digital DNA memorial uh, also possible via MitoSearch, so you can upload your mitochondrial DNA data to MitoSearch from your Family Tree DNA homepage. So you test your mitochondrial DNA with Family Tree DNA, and on your matches page, you can press the button to upload your data anonymously to MitoSearch. There's also GEDmatch, um, and you can upload your autosomal DNA data to GEDmatch, and that's the link there. I also have a Missing in Action DNA Legacy Project on Family Tree DNA. Um, everybody is welcome to join should they so desire, but it encourages people to, live, to leave a digital DNA memorial uh, to commemorate their fallen relative. And why do we do it? It's to convert this type of gra gravestone, a Canadian soldier of the Great War, known unto God, into this type of gravestone with a named individual and allowing a soldier the dignity of having his name on his own gravestone. And the reason why we do it is because it's the right thing to do, we can do it, and we will remember them. <laughs>